Right then. Danny Mitchell, the Cheesecake Assassin. Yes. Welcome to the studio. Yeah, yeah, great little place. Do you like it? Yeah, yeah, really good. You'll be recording out of here soon then, hopefully. Definitely, yeah, definitely. Um, so, yeah, the nickname, Cheesecake Assassin. <laughs> here I've we go. Got to, I've got to ask <laughs> about that. The number one question I get asked, yeah. Uh, just from a long time ago, really, I was uh, fighting on a show in uh, Sunderland, and uh, yeah, I, I'd made weight. I think my opponent had like a kilo to cut or something, so he's jogging round with a sauna suit on, and I just said to one of my mates, you know, just nipped it shop, just get us like a, a cake or something, and I'll, you know, I'll eat it as a bit of a joke while he's running round. So I started eating this cheesecake. And, uh, yeah, they decided to, in- they said, oh, can we interview you? I said, yeah, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> so they started interviewing me. And, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'm just eating this cake while they're interviewing me. And then halfway through the interview, I just threw the spoon and just started digging my hands in and just eating this cake. And I, I just talked a lot. It just, it just went from there? Yeah, yeah. I just <laughs> How old were you then? Were you, were you professional? Yeah, way? yeah, that was uh, uh, early days professional, maybe 2009. So ten years ago, all oh, right. Ten years ago, you're talking. It yeah. were on it recent. Um, Khabib versus Tony Ferguson when he got caught eating cheesecake and then he missed weight. Yeah, that was a thing, yeah. Isn't it? yeah, yeah. That's funny. It, yeah. Um, so tell me about your career. Then, how did you even get into fighting? Like, because I know mixed martial arts has only been. It's not. It's not. It wasn't that popular, I suppose, when you first started. No, no. It? Um, when I when I first got exposed to martial arts, it was just through like Bruce Lee films. Right, yeah. That that's kind of the earliest. I remember being a little kid and 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 wanting to do boxing. That was like the thing. I, I'm like, I'd seen boxing on TV. I didn't know anything about bo- any kind of boxers or anything. But I remember being a young kid. There's even a picture somewhere of me with. I posted it the other day on Instagram. Me me as a baby. I've got a nappy on and a pair of boxing gloves. You know. <laughs> So came, came out scrapping. Yeah, so I, I remember at a young, real young age, you know, that's something that I wanted to do, and I, and I distinctly remember a conversation with my mum and dad, and I said to them, you know, I want to do boxing. And they said, no, no, you're not doing that. It's you know, do something else. You know, play rugby or something. And uh, yeah, I just so I never, I never ended up doing it. So a few years later, um, I was into wrestling, just watching wrestling, and uh, uh, we all used to just you know, meet up and we'd all just wrestle with each other. I'm about 10 years old at this point, you know, yeah. just, just, at, I'm still at uh, primary school, just in the age where I'm just about to move up to secondary school. And uh, yeah, we, we'd just wrestle and it'd get out of van, you know, we'd be punching <laughs> each other. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it, we thought that wrestling, or I thought that wrestling at that point was real, you know, yeah, they, were, yeah. they were like older lads who used to do it with us and we'd like, we'd punch each other and stuff. And then, uh, yeah, I think I think uh, it got out of hand quite a few times. Yeah, and and one of the one of the the kids, it was actually my best friend at school, Nathan. Um, his dad was a he owned the local taekwondo school. So after you know we're all beating each other up and just being rough lads and stuff, and then uh, his dad kind of came round to everybody's. Uh, house, yeah. speak to her parents, saying, "Oh, you know, the lads have they've been doing this and that, and uh, I want to teach them some respect, and I, I and I'm going to give them a month free training at my martial arts school." Yeah. So at the time, everyone's parents thought, "Oh, you know, he's doing something good. He, you know, he, he wants to teach our kids some respect." Really, it was just a really good marketing ploy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> because uh, we all went, and then I think there was only me really who actually stayed. At that group of people, you know, all my friends went and, you know, they all tried classes and stuff. And I, I ended up staying, you know, I went every day. Yeah. And uh, I was a little kid at this point and I just loved it, you know, standing there throwing kicks and punches and uh, going on and watching Bruce Lee films. How old were you at that point? Sorry. This is like 10 years old. 10 years T- old, 10 right. years old, yeah. I'm, uh, like I say, I'm, I think I moved up to secondary school age 11. So when I was at secondary school from the first year that I was doing martial arts then. Wow. So, uh so yeah, I mean, I, I was into that, and it, it was taekwondo. That's what I was doing. Yeah. You know, I got my black belt in like three years. You know, just like a the, these belt factories where you just turn up, you pay your monthly dues, and then you know, these these little kids, six year olds, got black belts on and stuff like yeah. that. And, but but it was good. It, it was my introduction yeah. into martial arts, and uh, you know, th- there's a lot of people who are shit who've got black belts, but I I think that. 
you know, when I was training, I did get something good out of it. I was, uh, you know, I didn't know about fighting at that yeah. point, but I just wanted to be good at martial arts. So, you know, um, yeah, I was like 13 year old. I had a, I had a black belt on, but I was actually good at martial yeah. arts, you know, but the, you know, these days there's a lot of people who, who aren't. <laughs> so when did you get into um, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu then? Because obviously you're a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu black belt. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So when did you start? So, uh, so yeah, that, that sort of came a little bit later. Um, I I started off with Taekwondo and then it's the same gym. Um, you know, I think it was like on uh, every Saturday, this, this big, big tall guy used to come and he used to teach kickboxing. Yeah. So they'd be throwing low kicks and they'd be doing more like boxing training. And it was like a, a harder class. And so I, I'm just like a 13 year old kid or whatever. And I'm like, oh no, I, I want to do this as well. And uh, I remember the guy... He was from Rotherham, I believe. Craig Church is called. I've not heard anything of him or seen him for for years, so uh, it'd be interesting to see if he's still doing that now. But he, he looked like Ivan Drago, massive <laughs> tall. You know, I was just like this little kid looking up. He's this big, tall guy and uh, just beating everyone up, yeah. And so I started training, like, kickboxing, and then uh, I just had a, a passion for martial arts. Like, I, I wanted to find like, every club... So I'd go, if I could find like a judo club, I'd go to do judo, yeah. a, a kung fu club, I'd be good there. And then I'd come home and I'd write everything down, I'd learn. I, I just wanted to do martial arts. Yeah. There were not, not really compete. I, I'd competed in like uh, point fighting in taekwondo. Yeah. And then when I started doing kickboxing, I started to do tournaments, uh, like kickboxing style uh, tournaments. But I didn't really set out to do, I, you know, I wasn't thinking in my head, oh, I'm going to do this tournament, I'm going to be this champion. It's just kind of, you know, the, the coach would say, right, you know, uh, Sunday it's a tournament and, uh, yeah, we've got we've got to go to, you know, Nottingham yeah. and then I'll pick you up at this time. I'll be like, yeah, yeah. And, and then we just go to these tournaments and stuff. So and, nice. uh, it was sort of relaxed then. You just Yeah, you just it was enjoyed. by accident. Yeah, yeah it, there was no, like, I, I never set out. I never thought, oh, I mean, you know, I want to be like this kickboxer. And, you know, I just, I just turned up, same with Taekwondo. I just went yeah. to the tournaments, same with kickboxing. I just turned up. And then, uh, yeah, I, I just had a, I'd a, had a love for learning. I just wanted to learn. I'd yeah. get, you know, I'd get books, martial arts books. I was just a geek, a martial arts geek. That's basically it. And then is there such a thing as it? Yeah. And then from from that, um, I was training in a, in a gym in uh, in Doncaster, a new body gym. It's, it's shut. Well, there's a new version of that gym yeah. now, but the old the old gym. Um, yeah, we're a great place. A lot of character there, but uh, yeah, just an old back room. And we was doing. Um, I was training in there. We was doing like Filipino martial arts. Like I did that. I did Jeet Kune Do, which was like Bruce Lee right, style. Okay, yeah, yeah. We did that. You know, we were all in this little back street gym in uh, in Doncaster. And then uh, yeah, the, these there were these two guys. Um, they were grappling in. There were like a little makeshift boxing ring at corner. These two guys were grappling in there. And uh, yeah, doing submissions, choke, yeah. chokes, and things like that. And to me, at the time, it was just so, it was just another martial art. You yeah. know, I didn't think it was better than any of the others or anything like that. I just looked at it and thought, oh, you know, they're doing something different. So I asked them a few questions, and they said, "Listen, come back next week, and you can you can join in." Yeah. So uh, so I turned up. I think I'm like 15 years old at this point, probably. And uh, yeah, the w one guy had a. There was two guys. One guy had a blue belt on, and one guy had a white belt on. Yeah. Uh, and then the guy with the blue belt, he he said, "Oh, you know, you can have this gi." So he gave me like an old judo gi. It's all ripped under armpits. You know, it's just like fuck, like covered in, you know, in spit and yeah, blood. It, yeah, it, it's like it must have been his gi that he's used for like ten years, and he just <laughs> gave it to me. So I'm like, right. So I've got this, I've got this like old gi on. I've got some jogging bottoms and like some... That's your standard practice some, now, isn't it? <laughs> a a yeah. gi jacket and uh, tracky bottoms. Yeah, so. that's it. And then I've got some like karate white belt on. And then, uh, yeah, these guys just smashed me. Like I'm a, I'm a young kid. They just hold me down. Yeah, this is what you do. And they just smashed me into the ground. Like I couldn't do anything. Uh, and then, yeah, so I was, uh, I was still doing all these other martial arts. And then I, I was turning up to this class like once a week and just getting smashed. And, uh, yeah, it was it was tough. Yeah, but I didn't realize. I never thought that I'd be good at that. You know. Yeah. Because I, I, I was just getting beat up every week by these two guys, and then I remember one one time a, another young guy came in like, "Oh, can I join in?" So they put us together, and I think I managed to like 
tap him out with like a triangle choke or something. Yeah, yeah. That, flying that, triangle. I will, not, a fly, <laughs> not at that stage, but yeah, I think I caught him with like a choke or something and I was, inside I was like, yes, this is amazing. You know, I've I've been able to like, obviously it's not a fight, but it's yeah. like a win, isn't it? Yeah, of course it's, it is, yeah, it, yeah. And at the time I'd never tapped anyone. I'd just been crushed by these yeah. guys. And then, and then these guys disappeared and, you know, I carried on doing other martial arts. Um, th- those two guys was uh, Ben Poppleton and uh, Neil Owen, who were both high-level black belts now. Right. And and I've had them both at my gym uh, coaching, which is pretty cool. Oh, nice. But they were, like, the, my first uh, of proper... I, I'd seen grappling styles. Yeah. I've seen people doing grappling, but of Brazilian jiu-jitsu, those were the first two guys... That I'd ever seen do it do it properly, and uh, yeah, they they ended up uh, they went to Brazil and they trained in Brazil. Oh, right, okay. They came back and forth to Doncaster, and uh, yeah. Did so. you ever get out to Brazil to train? I I have been to Brazil, but I've never. I just went there for uh, when Jay Furness were fighting there. Right. Okay. Uh, but I've I've not been there to train. Yeah. Um, to be fair, I think most of the Brazilians now are in America. You yeah. Know, yeah. The, the the good black belts and stuff left and uh, yeah. open academies, you know, worldwide. Because so. you're quite notorious for you jiu-jitsu when you were on the when you're on a, when you were a professional because are you, have you still got the record for the most twisters no that's actually that rico that's, that's rico right now, now one of well, the he's got three. yeah he's got yeah, three yeah. yeah i was tied at two and then uh yeah rico's got three that's mad he's a scary dude yeah yeah, yeah. He's, he's, got, he's got a fight coming up with bare knuckle yeah boxing. he's fighting this uh this month yeah the 26th yeah. so you're talking like 10 days he's nice. fighting uh, show you support people come on yeah bare knuckle boxing he's in a tournament so 10 grand for the winner uh how does that work then i mean is it are all the fights on one night? Or no, is it no. Like so over a sequence yeah, of they're gonna stage it. Obviously, bare knuckle, you're gonna get bashed in um, pretty, pretty, <laughs> pretty easily. You know, punching your hands are gonna be sore, your face is gonna be sore. So yeah, he's got his first fight on the 26th of January, and then um, from from that, then you would fight. If you move through the tournament, you would fight in March, and then right. you'd fight in June, I believe. Um, so that's at the Indigo O2 uh, Arena. Nice. Um, yeah, so it's good. They do a really good... You say bare knuckle fight and you think, oh, you know... It sounds horrendous. I mean, I'd never... I, when somebody told me about it, it was um, the guys from the Make It Mastermind podcast. They had Smudger Smith. Who was ah, a, yeah, yeah, yeah. So Smudge is in that tournament as yeah, well. Yeah, he is, yeah. 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 And, and I'd listen to that and I went, is that even a... Th- like, because I thought it were brutal, obviously, UFC and mixed martial arts, and then they'll go bare knuckle boxing. I'm like, yeah. are you kidding me? But yeah, that sounds it sounds awful. Yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> and that's... And, and like, going back into... When I got started in jiu-jitsu, that's kind of the thing. So I'm doing these classes and then uh, I'm at like a car boot sale and I see these these like videos, VHS videos. And uh, there's like, I was always looking for that martial art. I, I like, one of the things I like to watch is the old Shaw Brothers Kung Fu films. Like I'm a bit of a geek with them. That's yeah. I've, you know, I watch them. And uh, so I used to try and find them at car boots. You know, I'd find these like old VHS Kung Fu videos and I'd watch them. So again, I'm like 15 at this time, and uh, I find this video, Ultimate Fighting Championship 3. It was number right, three. Okay. I remember this specifically, yeah? And uh, so I got it, and I lo- I'm i looking at it, and I'm like, oh, is this like wrestling? I'm thinking this is like WWE, and on the front it says, no, uh, no time limit, no rules. And I'm like, nah, this can't be, this is illegal, you know, yeah, this yeah. can't be a real thing. So anyway, I went I went back and uh, and I watched it, and the, you know they had no gloves on and the fighting. I'm like, shit, this is. There real. were no weight classes then. Were no there? weight no, classes. No. It was it was an eight man tournament, I believe. And uh, yeah, it was it was just crazy. I couldn't believe what I was watching. I'm like, <laughs> this is real. This is not like wrestling. This is, yeah. you know, the the elbow in each one's face. You know, this is this is real like street fighting. I was close as close to a sh- real street fight as you can get under the, the yeah. circumstances. So yeah, from that moment, I was like, this is what I want to do. Yeah. It was like that exact moment when I watched UFC 3. And weirdly, so Hoy, you know, Hoyce Gracie, he won UFC 1 and UFC yeah. 2, you know, and he, he was the guy who sort of put Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu on the map or Gracie Jiu-Jitsu on the map. So, you know, people saw him win these tournaments and they were like, that's what we need to do. But weirdly, UFC 3, he didn't win. Did not. <laughs> he ended up, I think he had a fight with Chemo, a guy called Chemo, yeah. Leopoldo, yeah? So he fought Chemo, he beat him, but he was so injured from the fight that he ended up dropping out. I think his brothers, like, carried him out of the cage. He was so injured that he never came out for the next fight. Right, okay. So uh, 
so they put like an alternate in, like a you know, like a reserve fighter. Yeah. I think uh, Steve Jenham, his name was. He was like a ninja, like oh, he's a ninjutsu practitioner. <laughs> Shows him backstage, like ripping some sandbags to pieces <laughs> with his bare hands. And then, so this guy's fresh. Yeah, you know, yeah. it's an eight man tournament. This guy comes into the final. He's fresh, and uh, yeah, he ends up. I think he hit someone with like a tiger claw or some shit, <laughs> and he actually beat he beat some big karate guy. And he beat him, and he became the the UFC champion, Steve Jenham, a ninjutsu right. guy. So the so the my first experience of the UFC was not Hoist Gracie winning, right, okay. and me thinking Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is the one. It was <laughs> some ninja guy. Because that's how um, Eddie Bravo has described it in the past. He said he saw the UFC for the first time, and, and he was doing karate, I think. Yeah, and then yeah. He were like. I, saw I this, need to be doing grappling. I, yeah, I saw yeah. this jujitsu guy and he's like, I need to do jujitsu. And obviously now he's got 10th planet. And Yeah, that, that's yeah. it. Yeah. I mean, so that happened for a lot of people. They saw UFC one and then they're like, right, let's, let's sack this striking game off. Grappling's what we need to do. Yep. And uh, yeah, so I never really had that. I kind of were like, yeah, this grappling looks all right. Yep. But you know, this striker, this, this ninjutsu guy won. So I'm still like researching all these martial arts and uh, it won't until you know, months later when I go back and I watch UFC 1 and 2 and then I actually see the value of, uh, of jiu-jitsu. Yeah. Um, so at that, at that time, I was doing a lot of my own training. Like I had, a, I had a, my dad had built like a garage at the bottom of the garden. I had mats. I had like matted walls and uh, I've just got a few people around and I'd like hold pads for them because yep. I was really interested in coaching. I mean, even doing taekwondo, when I was say twelve years old, they actually put me in charge of like, right, you teach this class now. Yeah. And uh, I, I was teaching kids and stuff, and I had I had a knack for coaching, um, so that I started to just do it, you know, with the stuff I was learning. I'd, I'd like get my mates round, and you know, I had like three students, yeah. and I'd be like, right, you know, we're gonna work these combinations, or all right, I've done this takedown, let's let's practice this. So you were just studying that in your own time, and yeah. Then, so yeah. I'd just do that in my own time, and and then what? One of the guys who was training with me, Chris, he was really interested in grappling. So we st- every day would meet up, we'd we'd grab, we'd practice some techniques, we'd get like books, DVDs. Yeah. We had like an old Henzo Gracie DVD. Um, from back in the day so we'd like watch a couple of techniques we'd practice them and then we'd just grapple yeah and uh, we got pretty good yeah nice. we, we did like we maybe did two years just training like that right. you know uh, and yeah I think we got pretty good and it got to the stage where eventually we went to a gym which was uh, Darren Darren and Helen Curry's combat based gym in Pontefract yeah. we ended up going there and we just turned up for a class and uh, yeah we introduced ourselves and he's you know, Darren's like, yeah, just join in. So we joined in and I think we like tapped a few people out and, you know, we weren't brilliant, but yeah. we, we know we had an idea of what we were doing. Yeah, you're holding your own. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and Darren asked us, he's like, oh, you know, where do you guys normally train? We're like, well, we don't. We just sort of train with each other. We've just been learning from books and stuff. Yeah. And he's like, oh, you know, you, you know you're you pretty good. So, uh, yeah, we, we just we just stuck at it and... Uh, Chris ended up, you know, he's a postman now. <laughs> All right. Okay. And uh, yeah, he just, after a few years, he just kind of, you know, he just went for him. He just yeah. didn't, didn't carry on doing it, but he was really talented. You know, he used to submit me. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I remember him competing and landing like a flying armbar in his first competition and stuff. Nice. Uh, so yeah, so I, I was competing in jiu jitsu and stuff back then. And uh, yeah, that so that were, so it was, I first saw it in Doncaster, did a lot of training myself, and then we ended up in Pontefract. And yeah. then, uh, yeah, that, that was kind of the start for me, jiu-jitsu wise. Yeah. I think I was probably about 18, 19. So when did then, you start training sort of MMA, then the, the, the package to get yourself into fighting? Obviously, you saw at UFC, that were always yeah. the ultimate goal to get into the premier promotion. And sort of like, when, when did you start fighting then? How old were you? Um, so I think I had my first MMA fight when I was around 16. So I'm like doing my own, I'm doing my own grappling training and stuff. And I had like a... I had like like a couple of amateur MMA fights um, when I was sixteen, and then I didn't do anything. All I did was train grappling. I yep. thought I need to I need to do grappling. And when I when I said I had amateur MMA fights, these were like on a mat in a sports hall. There was no cage, not even a ring. It was just a mat, a sports hall, like ten people watching. You know, it was just like a. It wasn't MMA, no. amateur MMA, what you see today. Yep. This were like you know you couldn't punch in the head. Oh, it right, was okay, very. Yeah, yeah. You know, it was just what someone had just made. They just made the rules up. You yeah, know, it, was, all, it, all, it would have all been still quite new at that point. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, there, there was a few of these little tournaments springing up. So I did a couple of fights, and then 
I just concentrated on grappling. I just like fell in love with grappling. I'm like, this is the this is the thing. I, I completely, you know, stopped doing any sort of kickboxing training, boxing training. I forgot about all that, and I just wanted to grapple. Yeah. And uh, yeah, then I think when I'm like 18, 19, then I started to see the value then in striking again. I'm yeah. like, oh, you know, if I can put all, it all together, build a package. You know, you, you're seeing. I was seeing fighters then around that time. It's like Tito Ortiz, people yeah. like that. So that you know, they're, they're throwing punches. Frank Shamrock, another one. You know, they're throwing punches and landing takedowns and yeah. submissions. So that's kind of when I, like 18, 19, I thought, oh, you know, I need to be working, you know, on everything. Yeah. And and then I started uh, started competing again in MMA. And at that time, uh, Paul Murphy had just started a, a show in Doncaster, which was on my doorstep, yeah. um, which was called Ultimate Force. So that was the first time I'd ever seen a cage in reality. Yeah, you know, yeah. like I'd seen a cage, I'd seen these cages on videos yeah. and stuff. But I went to Doncaster Dome. I walked in, you know, and it was. I think they, ca- they called the show, it was called Ultimate Force, The Cage Has Arrived. That's what it was called, yeah. So I'd never seen a cage. Yeah. You know, I'd been to these fights and they'd been, I'd seen MMA fights in a ring on mats, but I went there and it was the first time like, in person I'd seen a cage and I was just like, wow, this is, you know, there was just something about that moment where I saw this cage and I was like, this is... This is what I need to do. This is crazy, yeah. Because it's just not normal, is it? You know, no. locking people in a cage. I think, I think, obviously, it's all dramatized and glamorized on TV. Like you watch the UFC, and it's all crisp and pretty. Yeah. And then I, I sit down, and it, especially like going through YouTube and watching like the AVT videos, and you see like some of the, the fights that you've had at, at AVT, and because yeah. it ain't got like a big production behind it, you just hear the thud of people getting cracked. And yeah. You're like, Oh yeah, it's proper brutal. Isn't yeah, it, right? yeah. Because you put it on telly and it glamorizes it. Everyone will probably want to be a, a UFC fighter, or they think they've got it in them. Yeah. They go out on a weekend and they're just warriors. But yeah. yeah, it looks proper brutal. Oh yeah, it's a lot more raw and yeah. It, just from like I say, when I just saw that cage and everyone, everyone coming into the building, I'm like, this is crazy. Like I'm thinking in the back of my mind, I'm like, this should be illegal. Like yeah. this, this is gonna get shut down. Uh, but no, it, it didn't, and uh, I ended up uh, becoming good friends with a promoter. He, he was sort of like the first, my Paul Murphy was kind of my first manager, if you like, yeah. and he was the first person who I really knew who was who I would call a, an MMA coach. Right, like because back back then you got like you know you got like a kickboxing coach and you got guys who do grappling you got all but nobody really had the full package nobody yeah. really knew how to do MMA you yeah. know like now you can go to a gym and you know people come to my gym and I say right you're gonna throw a one two single leg you're gonna take the guy down you know you can kind of teach everything but yeah. back then you know you'd say to your coach oh you know what do I do if the guy shoots like this and they'd probably not know they'd be like oh, well you could try this I've heard um. Brendan Shaw talk like that before, you know, saying yeah. that now people are going to be black belts in MMA. Like there's going to, because the coaches are going to teach them everything that is, he's saying that that's going to be the next category, you know, like mixed yeah. martial arts, obviously mixed, but they're saying you're going to be an all rounder. Like that's what you're going to get. Yeah. The belts it, in. It's becoming like a, a, like a sport in itself. Yeah. Like, like with any sport, it's like with jujitsu now, like back in the day, Brazilian jujitsu was basically MMA, but without striking. Yeah. So it's like, if you was, a black belt, you take your gear off and you could go and have a fight, no problem. But now it's kind of evolved and it, it, the rules have, have made this sport evolve so that you can almost not, you can not be a fighter, you can just be really good at playing the game of jiu-jitsu. Right. You know, so, yeah. so there's high-level black belts out there who are absolutely savages on the mat. But if you put them in a fight with some gloves on and said go, they'd get the shit beat yeah, out of them. Yeah. Because their game is not based on fighting. It's based on the rules and the techniques of yeah. the sport of jiu-jitsu. It's yeah. like a completely different thing. And I think the more MMA and jiu-jitsu grow independently, they just get further apart. Yeah. And uh, for me, jiu-jitsu was always about being able to do it in a real fight. And that's why I really like Eddie Bravo because he's he's big on like, he does this combat jiu-jitsu yeah. now where, where they like slap each other in the head and stuff. But I think that the premise behind that is all about, you know, making it real. Like yeah. if you're holding someone in a position, if they can slap you in the face, palm you in the face, then that, you know, in an MMA fight, that's going to be a punch or yeah. an elbow. So it's kind of like a bit of a reality check. Is that something that you'd adapt at your gym then? Is that something you obviously try to bring in with your fighters? Yeah, I mean, I just try and teach jiu-jitsu yeah. from an MMA standpoint. Well, I know that when I've been in class with you, you do, obviously you say like, this is it with a gi, but also be aware that, if this arm's free, this in this is not where you want to be. You yeah, know? yeah, that's it. So I, I I try and teach MMA jiu jitsu. Yeah, 
you know, for pure jiu-jitsu, if I was to go to like a high level competition in just pure jiu-jitsu, I'd get beat because yeah. those guys just do jiu-jitsu. Yeah, yeah. You know, everyone's like, oh, do you want to do grappling competitions? It's like, <laughs> I did that when I was younger. I did a lot of grappling competitions and I did quite well. But I don't know. There's no motivation there for no. me. It's like a game in itself. It's like, if you want to be really good at jiu-jitsu, like don't do strike and stuff. Just yeah, do jiu-jitsu. Commit to that. But yeah, for, for what I do, you know, it's almost simpler. Yeah. MMA grappling is... is you know, there's less there's less things to do. You just got to do things better yeah. because you're gonna get punished if you do them wrong. Yeah. <laughs> so, Fair so tell me about the uh, your career in UFC. Then, um, obviously, when did you get signed for the UFC? What was the order? Did you go to Bellator then UFC or UFC? Uh, no, then Bellator? It was it was actually Bellator after. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I got so I'd, I'd been I started fighting uh, obviously fighting pro MMA. I think I made my debut in. What would it have been? Two thousand. I made my professional debut in two thousand eight, right. I believe. And then, uh, yeah, so I've been fighting early on in my career. I think I'm like seven and oh, eight, I think I got to eight and oh, and then I fought a guy called Eugene Fadiora. He was like a, I think he's like same record as me, like eight and oh or seven yep. and oh. We ended up fighting, and uh, he beat me. That was my first loss, and uh, after that. I fought Gunnar Nelson. Yeah. And, and people, like, I think it was John Kavanagh, Gunnar's coach, had put out there, he put on uh, Cage where he was like, oh, you know, who will fight? No one wants to fight Gunnar, who will fight him? And I just said, oh, I'll do it. And he's like, oh, sweet. So so we organised <laughs> a easy. fight. And, and people were saying to me, oh, don't you want to, like, don't you want to, you know, fight someone not as good and, and get a win back because you just lost? Yeah. And I'm like, no, nah, no, nah, I want to fight him. So I fought Gunnar and, uh, yeah, I, I got... It, Caught me in a rear naked choke first round. He's yeah. an absolute beast. Like everybody who I've ever fought, you know, I've had, what, 30 professional MMA yeah. fights. All the guys I lost to, I know that if I could fight him again, I'd be able, I could find a way to yeah. win, if you know what I mean. Like if we fought 10 times, I'd be able to win at least one of those yeah, times, yeah, yeah, you know. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I'd be, like, I, I could avenge a lot of those losses, but I think Gunner's the only one where I fought him and afterwards... I just thought, oh fuck, you know. Yeah, just I can't another, beat just another level. Is it yeah, just, yeah, I just thought I can't beat I, I can't beat this guy. Yeah. Like he's too good. And uh yeah. Well, watching him come back recently against Oliveira and he did that that elbow on his head. That's yeah. that's that's when I thought, yeah, it should be illegal this, because that was the most brutal elbow I've ever seen <laughs> in, in like in any fight I've watched. Like the blood yeah. that came out of that man's face so fast. Yeah. He, he, cut, he cut me that, that scar I've got there. That's uh, that's from a Gunnar Nelson elbow. Nice. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, he cut, he cut me open pretty bad. And, uh, yeah, he's just, he's just really good. And I, I always, I mean, I still believe now that one day he will be the, the champion. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I think he's brilliant, mate. He's so dead faced. Yeah. Know, yeah. Like I've, I, I've actually, uh, <laughs> I was in Ireland once and uh, we're in a, we're in, There'd, there'd been some fights and uh, one of his training partners Arnie Isaacson fought one of my training partners Wayne Murray so we we cornered him and then uh, yeah after the fight we're like in a bar and I remember I remember just getting drunk just drinking Guinness and like everyone goes to bed and it's just like me and Gunnar left and we're just like talking to each other and Gunnar's laughing and joking and he's like showing me videos and he's laughing I'm like this is crazy you know it's like a completely different like nobody really sees no. that and he's like laughing and we're just talking about stupid stuff and then obviously next time you see him, he's just like stone face, yeah. this like stoic guy. No, he's a cool yeah. guy. Good yeah, fight. yeah, he's, amazing fighter. Yeah, he's, he's a real cool guy. And like I say, I, I do, I do still believe that he's, uh, you know, his time still to come yeah. as as champion. I think that he can uh, carve out a, a route to that title. Look but forward to but it. we'll see. Yeah. yeah. So um, so yeah, I, I fought. So I fought Gunner. Lost to him. You know. Then um, I had a couple of fights, and then I ended up fighting in Sweden. And uh, I fought uh, a guy, uh, Nico Masoki, ended up fighting in the UFC. Right, yeah. Um, good fighter. Um, they brought me out there. I fought in Stockholm, his his hometown. And uh, yeah, I, I had a, a good fight with him. I went in there. I'd, I'd seen him fight before and he'd, he's a very strong starter. He'd come out and he'd finish people in the first round. That was kind of his game. He's like a big, strong guy. And uh, yeah, so I had this game plan. I said to Jay, Jay Furness came, came over. He yeah. caught, he actually cornered, and uh, I said, right, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put him inside my guard. Yeah, so I'm gonna jump guard. Yeah. This is like crazy. Like, like people are saying, why the fuck are you doing this? <laughs> like, if 
And, and I've tried it since then, and it's not worked. But, <laughs> but for this one moment, it worked. And I'm like, right, I'm going to jump guard. I'm going to hold him in my guard for an entire round. Yep. I'm going to gas him out, and then second round, I'll finish him. And he's like, are you sure? I'm like, yeah, that's what I'm going to do. So I'm like, I'm like telling people this is what I'm going to do. And then, uh, yeah, I went out there and I did it. I, I held him in my guard. I got punched in the face a lot for a round. And, uh, yeah, he came out the second round and uh, I think he was a little bit tired. I took him down and I, and I armbarred him. Nice. And uh, I got a great reception. Like the crowd, it was at the Globe Arena in Stockholm, which yeah. is a massive arena. And uh, the crowd were amazing. You know, like everybody, like I, I'd do something like I'd pass his guard or I'd land a punch and everyone would clap. It, right. it was really, to say I'm fighting somebody yeah, from yeah, their yeah. hometown, yeah. Well, so they understood, obviously they understood the techniques involved in fighting a lot yeah. more. Than, yeah, yeah, definitely. I think that um, over there, they've got a lot more like appreciation for like athletes. Yeah. And, and like, you don't see many fat people in Sweden as well. <laughs> the, the diets must be really good over there. Just all beautiful. L- out literally there. walking out street and everybody looks in shape like, fuck, I've got to fight one of these guys. <laughs> yeah. Rarely see fat people. Yeah, I, mean, yeah. I guess, uh, yeah, I guess it's just like the diet and the, yeah. the, the lifestyle over there. Um, yeah, that's kind of how it is. But so that were a real, really great place to, to fight for yeah. me, you know, like, um, and that. And you fought in Vegas as well, haven't you? You've been out to Vegas. No, so I trained in Las Vegas. I was right. supposed to fight in Las Vegas. Right. Um, but I actually, that was actually what the month that I was supposed to fight in Las Vegas, my dad died. Right, okay. Uh, so the fight got cancelled, but then I ended up out there after that, and I ended up training in Vegas for Bellator. Yeah. Uh, so I so I so I have been there, but I never got to fight there. I fought in America. Yeah. Um, I fought in uh, in Kansas City, but I never never fought in Vegas. Right. Okay. Uh, so that's uh, one that I didn't get to check yeah. off the list, but I'm sure you'll be taking your fighters there soon. Oh yeah, 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 definitely, definitely. Um, but yeah, sweet Sweden was a you know really good place. I yeah. got that I got that good win, and then I came back. I had a couple more fights, and then I ended up you know I had like a, a mixed record. I think I'm like fourteen and four at this at this point, and uh, yeah, they called me from Sweden like, oh you know, um, do you want to come and fight this guy? Um, he's just got cut from the UFC. Um, you know, co-main event. Do you want to fight? So I'm like, yeah, yeah, sweet, we'll do it. Uh, love fighting in Sweden. Yep. So I head over to this show, uh, Superior Challenge, it's called. Really great show. And uh, yeah, so w- went back over there. And uh, like, I never really had a coach. So, so I took Jay Furness the first yeah. time. Like, Jay's like one of my students, you yeah. know. And uh, this time I took uh, Tom Crosby. So at the time, Tom, like Tom's a professional fighter now, yep. you know, he's does a really good job. He coaches for me at the gym. But at this time, Tom's like an amateur. I'm talking like, he's, I think he's had one fight at this point. And I've got nobody, nobody can come with me to Sweden. Everyone's busy or, you know, I've got no coach. Yeah, so I'm yeah. like, Tom, do you want to come to Sweden? He's like, yeah, yeah, fuck <laughs> it, let's go. So, so Tom comes to Sweden with me and I'm fighting this like, fuck, ex-UFC guy. I've just got a student in my corner. It, it was just like a comical, a comical uh, trip. But yeah, we're uh, so we're backstage, and I ended up. The main event was Jens Pulver, who was a, a former UFC champion. Yeah. It was you know a legend in his day, and uh, yeah, he, he happened to be in our changing room. So he's in his changing room, and uh, yeah, he's with uh, he's with his brother Abel and his manager. So they're back there, and uh, I'm the fight before them up. Yeah, I think I'm co-main event there, main event. So anyway, the wrapping, uh, the wrapping, uh, Jens Pulver's hands, he's getting his hands wrapped, and then they look over to me. They're like, "Oh, you know, are you getting your hands wrapped? Do you want any bandages or anything?" And I, I said to Tom, "I'm like, do you know how to wrap hands?" He's like, "Nah, <laughs> nah." And I'm like, "Oh, fuck it." I said, "Listen, I'm just gonna choke, choke this fucker out, and then I'll be back anyway. So it don't matter about my hands being wrapped." And like everybody laughed. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, I went. I went out there and uh, second round choked him. Rear naked choke. Yeah, yeah. And then came back and there was like, as I'm walking back into the changing room, they're walking out ready to fight, and they're like, "I can't believe it! You know, you choked him out. You said that's what you're gonna do." And I'm like, "Yeah, yeah." So you're the I, original Mystic Mac, is what you're telling yeah, us. That's eh? it, yeah, that's <laughs> it. So I was just acting all cool, like, "Yeah, I knew, I knew I was gonna do that." And uh, so after, like, Jens ended up fighting. Um, and then he came back and then his manager or whatever said, oh, you know, uh, can I grab your email? 
um, you know, I'll email you, see if I can get you some cool fights and stuff. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. I'm like, that, that'd be really cool. Um, so yeah, so I passed on my email and uh, yeah, came back to England, buzzing. You know, I've got two big wins in Sweden. Yeah. Um, at that point as well, Nico, who I'd beat originally in Sweden, he'd been signed to the UFC. So I'd so I'd beaten two UFC fighters yeah. at this point um, in Sweden in their own town. So I, so I, I was buzzing. There were like a uh, a lot a lot of offers coming in for fights and stuff. And then I got an email. But I didn't realize when I, when I'm in backstage with Jens Pulver. So this this guy who was his manager, I, I didn't realize who it was right. until he emailed me, and then his name comes up, Monty Cox, and I'm like, Monty Cox, I know that name, and then it clicked. He was the guy um, back in the day when you got the Militic fight camp. So Pat Militic, you had like Tim Sylvia there, Jeremy Horn, Matt Hughes, yep. Robbie Lawler, yeah, yeah. all these people were in the same gym and. Monty Cox was the the guy the manager of all, the whole the team. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, oh shit! Like, <laughs> it's that guy. I like, didn't realize, you know, it didn't it didn't click. But I'm like, oh shit, that, that's the guy. Yeah, yeah. And then he messaged me. He's like, listen, I've got some. I've got, you know, I can get you some interesting fights. You know, all you got to do sign this contract. You know, and, and you can you can have you can still organize your own fights. Yeah. But if anything big comes along, you know, I can sort it. And I'm like, yeah, sweet. And. Uh, so I, you know, I sent sent all my information over, signed the contract, sent it, and you know, like I say, I'd, I'd just beaten two UFC fighters, yep. uh, and then the UFC was coming to England as well. Yeah. So I'm like, oh, you know, it'd be crazy if I could get on that, and then uh, can't remember when it was, but I know it was real bad weather, and uh, I had um, one of the young lads who used to. Uh, Used to help us out on the MMA shows. Elliot, he he was uh, he was with us, and it was re- real bad weather. He lives in York. Right. And I'm in Doncaster, and I'm like, listen, you're not going to be able to get back to York. All the trains have stopped. It's yeah, like yeah. bad snow, whatever. I'm not going to be able to drive. I said, why don't we? We'll sleep in the gym tonight in Thorn. Yeah, and then uh, then I'll take you back tomorrow. And he's like, yeah, cool. So we actually slept in the gym. <laughs> we had like sleeping bags and shit. We're like watching UFC, and I think it's four a.m. Um, my my phone pings. And I open it and it's an email from Monty Cox. I'm like, oh, what's this? Obviously, they're on a different time. Yeah, of course. Towards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I open it and, uh, yeah, it just says, you know, um, here's a contract from the UFC. Congratulations. And I'm like, shit. No way. This is it. Yeah, I'm in the gym. It's like four in the morning. I'm freezing. So I got up. I'm like, yes. I wake <laughs> Elliot up. Like, Elliot, I'm in the UFC. He's like, no way. And then we just went back to sleep. That's the next day I woke up and I'm like, did I fucking dream that? Because this is, <laughs> I'm, I'm asleep in a gym. It's fucking freezing. Like, well, I'm just that cold that I'm just having yeah. these mad thoughts. But I checked the email was still there. So how long and, was uh, that before your first fight that you, you reckon you, you got that then? Because like, um, I've got here that you, obviously the UFC were uh, March 8th, March, 2014. Yeah. yeah, so I think this this was around, around about, Christmas time, I think. Yeah, so, so I think early December, yeah. maybe, maybe, yeah. So you, you know first... what? I bet, I bet, I bet I can find this email. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get a deep dive then. Yeah, yeah. so I've got to hear it. Obviously, if that for that first UFC that you were on, Fight Night thirty seven, Gustafsson versus Manua. So, so this is this is funny because this is it. This is where we find this out he's just it, been yeah. signed to UFC again. So this <laughs> is <laughs> just got another email. Shit, <laughs> shit, I missed that one. So this is on the six of December 2013 um and I'll show you there that that's the that's the email that I woke up to <laughs> right Danny we have a four fight deal with the UFC yeah it states the pay yeah um of, of, of course it's an exclusive deal so no other fights yeah so crazy to and, the bottom, and congratulations you're a UFC fighter yeah Monty, that's that's <laughs> unbelievable so, that. so that's that's like what I woke up to yeah wow crazy that's cool it that <laughs> yeah so i've still got that so yeah so yeah so i'm right december uh 6th of december 2013 so yeah i was signed to the ufc that's amazing yeah crazy so you obviously went on to that fight there so you fought igor arujo arujo yes yeah tough brazilian guy um he'd been training out of jackson winkle john right yeah um yeah so uh yeah it was it was in london and uh o2 arena yeah, t- tough fight. Yeah, it, it was a tough guy. I I had him in a leg lock at one point, and I remember hearing his knee just popping. 
And I'm just looking at him and just shaking his head like, nah. nah. <laughs> Not today. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then, uh, what was it like walking out then onto UFC stage? You, for the first you know time? what? Every, everybody asked that and uh, it was just normal. Another it night. just felt normal, yeah. yeah. Um, a lot of people like really, uh, really get like kind of hyped up and stuff. But I think because I'd, them shows I'd fought in in Sweden, especially the first one at the Globe, it was so big. That 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 show was so big there, and the card was like a UFC card. Yeah. This is this is pre UFC Sweden, so the UFC had not been there at this point. Um, so they had all all the top Swedish fighters were were on those cards. Yeah. You know, you Gustafsons, all these guys are on those cards anyway. So it's like I'd basically fought on the UFC, yeah. but it just wasn't called the UFC. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so so I'd already been exposed to like massive massive events like that. So when I walked out, yeah, I just enjoyed it. I remember walking and just smiling and laughing, and then, yeah, it was it was it was it's sur- surreal. And then uh, I had one of me one of my friends, uh, Kama Akoru, He was in my corner, and uh, along with uh, Craig Burke, Brendan Chaplin, there was there too. And I remember Cam just leaning over the cage. Fight's about to start. I look and there's like this Brazilian guy looking at me. I look at Cam and he's so nervous. <laughs> he's like, "Come on, come on!" He's like, he's look so nervous. And I went, "What are you nervous for?" I said, "I've got to fight this guy." <laughs> and it was just a funny moment. Like I felt so relaxed. Yeah. And uh, I, I think maybe that probably worked against me in a lot of my fights. I think I had so many fights as like a kid, and and then you know, as it as I got older and fighting became like if you said, "Oh, you know, there's this fight now." You know, you got to go and do this fight. It's in 10 minutes. I'd be like, right, sweet. You know, yeah. that's just second nature to you. Now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't really get that like adrenaline dump, but I think that's important for fighters to have that. So maybe. Well, you, you think know, it's important for them to have that? Yeah, yeah. Not, not like not, a, not too much, not a but, massive one, yeah, yeah. but I think you need that little bit of adrenaline, yeah. anxiety. I think you need that. And I think I'd got to a stage where I'd completely, like, I was just flat. Like, I was going out there and I'm like, yeah, we're just fighting. This is normal. And I want in like a heightened state, like right, okay, um, yeah. you know, like you would in a street fight. Like yeah, yeah. In, in a street fight, like someone throws a punch and then boom, you you're fighting, and then afterwards you're like, fucking hell, what happened? It was like thirty seconds yeah. of craziness. You know, he punched me, I did this. You don't even realize what's gone off. See, I but, thought you'd want to be like how you said. I thought you'd want to be. Yeah, yeah, just, and, and I did as yeah. well. I did. It's only looking back now where I think, oh, maybe that was a problem. You know, right. people say, oh, you're so calm, and I'm always like laughing and joking. You know, before we're walking out, I'm like joking and stuff. Yeah. And uh, yeah, people are like, come on, switch on. And I'm like, well, I am. I'm just, I just feel normal. Yeah. So, so I thought that was, that was good for me. Yeah. But maybe in hindsight, maybe I needed that little bit of an extra spark. Like looking back, watching some fights when I'm like 18, 19, I was a lot more aggressive. Yeah, you can see you. But I was a lot wilder as well. Like I'd make a lot more mistakes. And I think that's what was in my head. Like as a kid, I I wanted to be technical. I'm like, oh, I want to be so technical. Like nobody can outskill me. And I think I concentrated so much on that and being relaxed and technical that I forgot to like, you know, get hyped up and just sometimes just go for it. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. Uh, Is that, do you have any regrets from, from fighting? Like what you could have done or what you... Uh, yeah, yeah and no. I mean, I, I'd, overall I've got no regrets, but yeah. when, I, when I look back, I think, oh, you know, I wish I'd have just done that and changed this yeah. and may, maybe this would have happened. But yeah, I, I'm not one of them people who dwell on it. Yeah, yeah. Same with like losing fights. I, like I say, a lot of the people I know, I could fight him again and and beat them. I know I know a way to beat these people. Yes, yeah. But I'm not that guy who you know I've obviously trained with a lot of fighters and stuff. And a lot of people they'll lose to someone. Oh, right, I want a rematch. Get me with him again. Yeah. And it plays on the mind, and they're probably waking up in the morning like, oh fuck, I need to beat this guy, you know. But with me, I know in my own mind what I can do. You know, I know that if I fight Gunnar Nelson. You know, I've trained for six months of fight going to Nelson. I'm probably going to lose. Like yeah. I've accepted that in my mind, yeah, yeah. and the people who I know I can beat if I train properly, I've, I know that in my own mind. So I don't need to prove it to other people. Yeah, yeah. So I, I kind of let let it all go. Stuff like that. I'm quite quite good at just like just just leaving well, it. That's good. And that experience, I suppose, now you'll be just feeding that into your fighters as well, out of your team. You know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, a lot of fighters coming from other gyms have commented. Uh, on like the backstage warm up that it's very relaxed and like, oh yeah, you know, at my old gym, they used to be really strict and like, oh, you know, you got to do this. And it was very, and they said, oh, you know, I didn't really enjoy it. But, you know, for me, fighters being happy is a, is a big part yeah. of it. Like if you, don't, if you, if you've signed up for this fight, yeah, you're going to fight and you're not enjoying it. That's like, 
you're not going to perform. No. If, if you can enjoy the process, you're choosing to fight. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You've, you've chosen... To, to choose something you don't like doing is pretty. Yeah, it's no. not good. Did it's you, not a good idea. Did you see idea. any of the uh, backstage footage of um, Tyson Fury before he had the Wilder fight? You yeah, yeah. Singing, yeah, and singing. Like, all, all, all that's kids. yeah, like, that's great. That's yeah. what you know. I really love that. You know, get some music on backstage, laugh, joke. You know, there's a time to like, right, let's switch on, let's hit some pads, and like think about what we're doing. But then in you know when I've done that, then I'm I'm laughing and joking and. Yeah, you, you got to enjoy it. I think yeah. that's a massive thing. I think so. I see so many fighters like, oh, you know, I'm really nervous and, I, you know, I'm, I'm not enjoying this. But I think, like I say, a happy fighter is a dangerous fighter. And yeah. if you're enjoying it, if you're enjoying what you do, it's just like going to work. Yeah, of course it is, yeah. If you go to work and you enjoy it, you're more productive, you know, just things are just better. Yeah, so, I mean, f from, from what you've said, it sounds like you were sort of, almost born to do it like you, you started from such a young age that it became second nature to you and then those that i suppose that are fighting and they're they're obviously scared to do it but then they're not quite enjoying it maybe they're doing it for the wrong reasons you know yeah like maybe they do, maybe it's vanity they just want that yeah photo yeah yeah they want with, with gloves on you know take a photo in front of a crowd and they're doing it for, you know just to sort of prove a point whereas actually they don't want to be in there i mean who wants to get punched in the face for a living like there's only a few <laughs> yeah, people in the world it. really that want to do it you know yeah like that's, it takes us it's going to take a special sort of individual to say right this is Definitely. what i want to do yeah for oh, it's not normal it's not a normal thing to do and, th and there's a lot of different reasons why people fight you know people fight you get these people who are like from the slums you yep. know they've got nothing like palaharas you know he's he's raising the favelas he's got nothing he wants to feed his family he's like winning winning bonuses and he's like oh yeah i'm gonna buy my mum a house yeah, or whatever yeah. you know that there's something about that kind of person that's like that's just like ingrained in them. Yeah. You know, they've had to fight growing up. And then you get the people who've got, you know, maybe they come from a rich family. Yeah. Someone like BJ Penn, his family have got a lot of money. Yeah. You know, so he, he managed to, he got his Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt in like three and a half years, four years, something like that, real quick. Yeah. But, you know, he's got the ability, he don't have to work, he can just do Jiu-Jitsu for like six hours a day. Yeah. So he can get really good at that, but, you know, that's that's the complete opposite to that guy who's raised in the favelas who's yeah, fighting yeah. to feed his family, you know, so it's different. And uh, it's mad. And I mean, the guys that obviously the people turning pro now and they're still working full time at whatever, you know, like them, they could be working, it could be in an office job, they could yeah, be working yeah. as they could be like a, a lawyer. Yeah. And they're just trying to get that one shot to obviously find that promotion. It's mad. Like everyone's obviously got their own mo motivation to, to get there, but. Yeah, I mean, take me hat off to all of you. Like, yeah, I, yeah. I can't imagine stepping into a cage and fighting with anyone. It's just, I love watching it, but it's just crazy to see, you know. Yeah, it's interesting, you know. You know, for, for me, the, the the thing with the gym now is it's like a big experiment for me. It's like a it's like a psychology experiment. Yeah. So, because I'm going backstage, we've got fifty fighters now, and and I'm, and I'm backstage and I'm seeing other fights from other gyms, and it's like seeing how each one of those people reacts differently. You know, you're warming them up like. You know what? What are they doing in the warm up? Yeah. Are they happy? Are they are they nervous? And everybody's different. And, and somebody who's like in the gym, who's really confident in that warm up room, you know, it's like it's like that warm up room. It just strips everything away. Yeah. You know, like all the lies, all the front, all the like, yeah, I'm gonna smash everyone. When yeah. you get in that warm up room, and it's like, right, this guy's gonna do this. this is what you're gonna do. Then you see the real. You see the real person. Yeah, yeah, and I, I kind of like that. It's, yeah, yeah. It's, some, it's uh, yeah, I, I kind of like that bit more than the actual fight. I think now, because so it, it, obviously you're in warm room and there's other teams in there with you. Yeah. So are you looking at other coaches and saying, right, I need to, you you're taking a bit from each person and saying, right, I might adopt that on on my coaching style. Do, do you see any of that? Yeah, I mean, you're always. In this game, you're always seeing other people, other fighters, and yeah, I, I do like that. I see, I like looking and seeing how other people are warming up, and uh, you know, for for a long time, I was trying to figure out the model, like yeah. how am I gonna? I was thinking, right, there's a, there's a, there's a there's a set way, like how am I gonna warm all my fighters up, and like let's do the same for everyone. Let's yeah. have like right, you're gonna do, you know, three minutes, you're gonna skip, and then you're gonna do this. And then, but the the more I've kind of looked into that and looked at all these different coaches, the more I realize that it's different for every single yeah. person. Every single person. Some people need to just sit quiet with the music on and yeah. not no one speak to them and do a very short warm up. Some people need to be warming up like an hour, two hours before, start moving, yeah. and doing little bursts. So I think it, it and it's about as a coach, it's about finding that one thing that 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 exact person needs to do. Yeah. 
and then doing that. Have you listened to um, Joe Rogan's podcast with Dean Thomas? No, that, his latest one, no, I've not listened to that they yet. They talk about that, and uh, yeah. he, he talk, obviously he's an American top team, and he, he talks about the different styles of fighters. So you've got some that are fighters, and they're just absolute lunatics, they just want to scrap. Yeah. You've got others that are artists, and you've got to coach them completely differently. Yeah, you've got yeah. to warm up differently, and that, that's that's what you're saying. Like, yeah. I get that. You know, There's some people that are just lunatics that want to go in, they just want to have a big... Big warm up at the beginning and go in and just start scrapping. Other ones are artists. They want to go through the technique. They want to make sure everything's, yeah, definitely. everything's sweet. So yeah, now that, that yeah, makes sense. Yeah, there. yeah. You got people. Someone like GSP, who's like a you know, he's an athlete, he's a martial artist. And then you got someone like Nick Diaz, who's just like a fighter. He yeah. just wants to fight, bite down his gum shield and try and take your head off. Yeah. You know. So you got and there's everything in between that. You got people who are a mixture of both. I'd like to think I'm kind of a mixture of the two. Like, yeah. like I feel like. I'm a natural fighter, but I I wanted to be a technician, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Like I, I wanted to be technical. And when I was younger, I'd, I'd fight. Some of my fights, I watch them, I'm like, how the fuck did I get knocked out? You know, because I'm just like, ah, yeah, just yeah. going crazy. And then I, I honed that down into like, right, let's be super technical. And then I got too technical. And yeah. then I, you know, so it's, it's about finding that balance. For me, it were always trying to get that balance between like, you know, fighting and, and but being, uh, having that self sort of um, control, yeah. you know, to be technical and not make mistakes and keep your hands up and stuff. So, yeah, it's a, for me, it's, uh, but it's interesting, you know, seeing how all these different people and how they train together and interact with each yeah. other, it, it's, it's crazy. I think um, watching the, uh, like, Ultimate Fighting, um, you know, the TV programme. Yeah, Ultimate I think that's Fight, yeah. The Ultimate Fight, I think that's a really good insight into yeah, watching, yeah. you know, watching how different people are. Like yeah. watching the one with... Um, Ryan Hall, who obviously just submitted BJ Penn, yeah. watching him and then the other people that were in his camp, like he's a completely different person. He's like on a different spectrum to, to yeah, all of them, you know? yeah, yeah. Like he wants to do one thing, he wants to get that leg lock and he's out of there, yeah, he doesn't want to get yeah. punched. I think you're on the same one as Artem Lobo, yeah, yeah. with Conor McGregor. Yeah. Yeah, cool. So um, to our, moving towards back into your career then, um, on your AVT TV, um, on one of the episodes, you talk about your time in Thailand prior to your f- second to last fight. So yeah, yeah. yeah. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, that that was basically the start of the end for me. Yeah. Um, so I'm in I'm in Thailand. I'm training for a fight, and uh, yeah, I we're riding around. This is like day two or three in Thailand. We're riding around on bikes. Um, luckily, I, you know, a lot of people ride around on bikes. No helmets on in Thailand. Luckily, I had mine on. Uh, we're coming down like a big hill, and uh, it's red hot. Starts raining, and. Uh, we're going around this like big bend. I just start sliding. My bike hits the ground and I just fly straight over the barrier at the side of the road. And my head, I'm literally looking at like a, like a lamppost, yeah, like yeah. a steel lamppost. And I'm just flying towards it. But I'm going that fast. I can't even get my hands up. You know, I'm literally going head first. My hands won't move there yeah. fast enough. And I just headbutt this, this like steel post. Okay, no. And I remember just lying on the floor thinking, I'm paralyzed yeah. or, you know, my, I've broke my back, my legs broke. And I'm just laying there like, oh, shit. And, uh, yeah, I can hear people, I can hear, like, loads of commotion, like, lots of other people had crashed behind me as well. Oh, right, just, okay. just, just a massive, just, yeah, clusterfuck of bodies, Fucking basically, hell. on this hill. Like, cars were just sliding. It, it just, there must have been some, like, oil or something yeah, on the yeah. ground. And then the, re- like, this range just, and the heat and the rain, it's all just mixed yeah, together. Yeah, yeah. Just that exact moment, everything just went wrong. Um, and then, yeah, I just, I jumped up. I'm, like, over the barrier in all these, like, bushes and shit. And then, uh, yeah, I was just real confused. And I remember this woman just running towards me, like, saying, sit down, sit down, you're in shock. And I'm thinking, why am I in shock? What yeah. am I in shock about? Then I start panicking. I'm like, <laughs> I'm in shock. What the fuck's wrong with me? Like, and I, I'm, like, wiping my face. I've got blood on my face. Um, my helmet's come off. Like, I headbutted. My, it was my helmet that hit the actual bat, the, the post. Yeah. But then my helmet's flew off. So I find it, and it's got a massive crack down it. Fuck I'm like, man. oh, shit, this is not good. And then all I'm thinking is, right, I'm supposed to be fighting. Like, oh, fuck, you know, what what am I going to do? I'm like, oh, no, no. And then uh, luckily there was a, there's like a, 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 like an ambulance, a guy on a bike. It was like a, <laughs> like a medic's bike. Yeah. He was behind us. So he came over and he, he like bandaged me. Like up, my knee was completely fucked. I had just had blood dripping out of it. Literally, I had tarmac like stuck inside. Were you just in like shorts and t-shirts? Yeah, and, I had flip and a piss pot helmet. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I can see it now. Yeah, yeah, yeah I had uh, 
I had the shorts on, flip flops, and a vest, and then uh, yeah, this this helmet. So yeah, this guy he like he like tapes me up, all my foot were all cut up and everything, and uh, yeah, I was like fuck. So I look down, I see I see my bike on the floor, I pick it up, and then I'm like, hold on, this is not my bike, and I look, my bike's like. 50 yards down the fucking hill. <laughs> That's where I would have been if I hadn't have hit this fucking post. Oh. You know, so I'm like, oh, shit. So I walk and get it. Every, you know, it's all on my bike, smashed in. The handlebars are all bent and that. And everyone's saying, you need to go to hospital. You need to do this. And, I, and in my head, all I'm thinking is, I need to get back to my hotel and just fucking lay down. Yeah. Like, I, my, my head had just gone. I'm like, I just need to get to my hotel, like, by any just means Just go necessary. reset. Go back, reset. Yeah, yeah. What and the fuck's I'm, happened? I'm like, I've got this bike. It's all smashed up. And I'm like... I'm gonna have to pay for this bike. Yeah. So I'm, I'm trying. I get the bike started and it's it's going. So I'm like, boys, I'm just gonna fucking ride back. And they're like, no, nah, no. Nah. And, and some of the other guys are with me. Like Rico's got like pieces of fucking glass stuck in his arm. Like he's fucked. Oh, up. Oh, was he there as well? Yeah, he's there right, as okay. well. Yeah. So he's fucked up. There's like other people with us who've fell off. And uh, so yeah, so I'm just going like super slow. I get back to my hotel. Rico comes in my room. I lay on bed and I'm just like, fuck. That, then I'm I can't really remember. I'm like fucking hell, what the fuck happened there? Yeah. Like, and he's like, oh yeah, you went over the barrier. I thought you were dead. Like, every, everyone was saying, oh, I thought you were dead. I'm like, fuck, I thought I were dead. I was laid there like shit, and uh, <laughs> and, I, and I've heard lots of bad stories about people dying on bikes over there. As oh well. yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, I'm laid there. And I said, I said, fuck, like I can't really remember. And I said, how long have we been in Thailand? Rico's like, oh, this is day three. But in, in my head, I'm thinking I've been here for like a month. Like I can, And I could even see had myself. You, had you been to Thailand before this? Yeah, right, yeah. Okay. So I've been before. Yeah, yeah. So obviously my mind's thinking about previous trips or yeah. something. And I'm like, shit, I thought I'd been here longer than that. And I'm like, I'm fighting, right? And he's like, yeah, yeah, you're fighting. It's in like a month's time. I'm like, oh, shit. He's like, what are you going to do? I said, I don't know. I'm just going to I'm just gonna lay here and think about it. So, so I laid down and I, and I just... My mind had gone, you know, I, I couldn't really remember what I'd done and I'm looking down, my knees fucked. I'm just yeah. like, oh, this is not good. And I'm like, shall I, shall I just go home? Like, I ring my girlfriend, I'm like, this this bad thing's happened. And she's like, oh, no, no, just, just come home, just come home. And I'm like, no, no, but, you know, I've spent this money, I've come to Thailand, I've paid all this money for this training yeah. camp. And then I need to fight to get the money from the fight as well. Yeah. So it's like, if I don't fight, I'm not going to get paid. And you've spent all this money. And I've spent all this money and I'm like, no, I'm just going to stay. I'm just going to ride it out and I'll see how I go. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I decided to stay. So the next day I went for a run and uh, it might have even been, oh no, I might have even been the same day. Like later that day I went for a run and I ran and I thought, oh, you know, I feel all right. I feel all right. And then I woke up the next morning and I'm fucked. I was hobbling. I couldn't really walk. My knee was all swollen. And I still had all, like, the tarmac was, like, stuck in, in my in my skin. So I had to go to the, like, pharmacy. I got, um, I got like, iodine. Yeah, yeah. Like, uh, like, salt water solution. I'm, like, cleaning it. I'm, like, picking all this fucking shit out. It was horrible. And, and over in Thailand, it's really easy to get, like, infections, like, staph infection. Yeah, yeah. So in my head, I'm thinking, I am... I've got this gaping hole in my knee. I'm like, I am getting staff. Yeah. Like I am, you know, Nailed no on. way I can, I can protect this. So I think I spent about 200 quid, which in Thailand's a lot of money yeah. at the pharmacy. I bought bandages. I had everything. And every day, twice a day, I cleaned it all out. I was doing this religiously yeah. and then taping my knee up. And then when I would go in, so I was running in the morning. I was just doing like a run. And then on a the night I'd go and I'd hit, I'd just hit pads. Yeah. I'd throw, I'd just hit pads boxing and then I'd go right low kick. Yeah. I'd just do that. And uh, I'll just I'll just try to get through it. I couldn't kneel down, so I couldn't do any grappling because I, I couldn't physically kneel on my knee because yeah. it was literally like down to the bone, you know. Fuck. Um, it just scraped it off. And I couldn't really bend my leg fully either. So but I thought I'll just I'll just do what I can. And then I'm like, shit, I'm not even sparring. So yeah. um I met up with a friend of mine over there who was at Tiger Muay Thai. He's called Glenn Sparv. He's a re- real good fighter from uh, Finland. Um, so we was actually supposed to fight like years before and I ended up going to Thailand and meeting him and we trained and we ended up being uh, being good friends. He's a, he's a real good fighter, uh, do, doing well out there. He's been living there for a long time. Right. So we, I'm like, 
Glenn, I need I need your help. Will you just do like some just move around with me? Like I, I couldn't spar properly. Yeah. I'm like I just need to like move around and just to see if I can do it. So we did some sort of like just real light, just like boxing, a little bit of clinch, and yeah, I kind of got through it. And I thought, yeah, I fe- and I felt all right. Yeah. I thought, you know, I thought I'm gonna be able to do this, uh, but I'm not grappled whatsoever at this yeah. point. And uh, yeah, so I ended up coming back. Um, I cut cut weight. My, my weight was fine. I got my weight down just from just from like jogging, just yeah. slow jogging. I could do that, and I could do a little bit of pads, a little bit of sparring, and then uh, yeah, I came back and I fought. Um, it's when I fought Andy Devent. He uh, he took me down. I'd only trained striking, so I'm like, if I can just stay on my feet. Andy and just, Devent is he the is he the black guy that was on. Did, did, on the video of, of that fight, is he the one that came down holding his kid on his shoulder? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I saw that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah, he's a good guy, Andy. Really yeah, good yeah. guy. And uh, with Fleetwood Town on his on his uh, <laughs> this, on his on his jersey. Yeah, yeah, yeah I know you mean. He's, he's a good guy. So, uh, but anyway, he was actually in Thailand as well. when I was there. He was actually in Thailand as well right, on the okay. same fucking street. We're training like oh, right. on the same street. Yeah, so I'd see him, but I made sure that I wore like um, spats, so I, I had my knee covered all the time, so he couldn't see. Yeah. I remember once coming out of the pharmacy, and he was actually there. And he's like, oh, Danny, how's it going? Yeah, let's have a good fight. And I'm thinking, fuck. You're limping round. Yeah, I'm like looking down at my knee like, can he see this? But I've just been buying all these fucking bandages and shit. So, yeah, so I felt good. I went in there and I thought, let's just try and strike. Um, he, he ended up taking me down. I jumped on a guillotine. But I'd, I'd not been grappling, you know. I didn't yeah. quite have it. He slipped out. And he literally hit me with like one, two little punches. Yeah. And boom, I went out. Yeah, I remember I watched that fight yesterday. Yeah, actually. I yeah. thought I'll do it. I wanted to just have a look at you, you, like your latest fights. Yeah, I just wanted yeah. to watch. And I saw it and it, it was literally just one time. Because uh, Frank Mears was um Yeah, he was a commentator. And yeah, he was like, yeah. what the fuck? Like, what's happened there? Yeah. It, it, looked, it didn't look like much, you know? Yeah, so so he hit me a couple of little shots. I went out. And then, yeah, I, I remember next thing. I can't remember anything from that point. I just remember being in the changing room after the fight. And I looked down. My hands were wrapped. And I thought, fuck, I'm... I must be fighting soon. I best start getting warmed up. So yeah. I start like loosening off. And then I think Jay Furness or someone comes over to me, taps me on the shoulder like, oh, unlucky, mate. You know, don't worry about it. And I thought, oh, shit, I've, I've just had a fight. How did, how did that feel? You must have been oh, absolutely yeah. petrified. Yeah, I was like, shit, this is not good. Like, oh, this okay, is, no. like, I, I thought I've had a piece of my fucking brain punched out. But obviously, I, I'd, and the time I'd experienced this before was in Thailand, you know, when I come off the bike, it was like the same feeling, but a little bit worse. Right. And I was like, shit, you know. Yeah, yeah. Like, in hindsight, I should have just not done anything. I should have just not said, no, I'm not fighting and let my brain recover. But yeah. because, I, you know, I've come off the bike, I've gone in there, it's hit me. And I've took some big shots in my career, you know. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of the fights, I've took some heavy punches and stuff and I've just been able to ride it. But literally that, there was nothing I could do. It hit me a couple of times and I just shut off. So yeah, that was devastating because I, I was like, this is it. I can't fucking, you know, I need to recover from this. Yes. So then I, you know, started getting the brain scans and stuff and then, uh, yeah, I started struggling struggling with uh, memory and yeah. things like that. And that's and that's what you did straight after that. You, you started having brain scans and started yeah, sort of like yeah. trying, to, trying to make amends really. Yeah, so just, to, just to see, because I thought, what if I've got some kind of problem in there? But they, yeah. they couldn't see anything. There's no, there's no like... Um, no damage that they can physically see. Yeah. Uh, but then, you know, I was speaking, I was in Leeds uh, with a top neurologist who was uh, who was speaking to me and he was saying, listen, you know, th- they did some tests and stuff and it, and it's, they can't really pinpoint it, but they can make like a guess and they want yeah. like, listen, you know, um, it's like dementia pugilistica, which is like punch drunk syndrome, they used yeah. to call it. They said, listen, you kind of, you're on, the, there's like a sliding scale and, yeah. you, and you're somewhere on there and it may get worse and it may not, but, you know, that's what you got to be aware of. Yeah. And then, you know, start talking about CTE, which is um, what a lot of the NFL players get from concussions. Yeah. You know, people talk about uh, post-concussion syndrome. And actually, Andy Devent, I've, I've, you know, I've spoke to him a lot, um, you know, since the fight. I spoke to him and, you know, he, he has similar problems. Right. Stuff. He's, had, he's had a lot of hard fights and, you know, and it's not just that one, you know, that one incident in Thailand and no, then the fight. It's like a... Yeah, yeah, you know, you know, I've been, I've, I've been, I've been hit a lot in fights before. Yeah. You know, I got stopped. Jake Boswick hit with a, with a massive right hand, nearly 
fucking took my head off my shoulders. You know, but I rec- the thing is about that is it knocked me down hard, but yeah. I recovered straight away. Like after the fight, I lost the fight, but then I was like, I'm fine. Yeah. I can remember what happened. I remember everything. The difference was with the Thailand and the Devent fight is I couldn't remember. Like it, like my memory had gone. Yeah, yeah. And that that's what were worrying me. So, uh, so yeah. So, um, I started sort of researching like CT and stuff. There's, there's no like um, the NHS don't have any sort of program that yeah. can put you on or any kind of drugs or anything. It's kind of like don't get punched. Don't do combat sports. You yeah. know, avoid any collisions and just try to live a healthy lifestyle. That's yeah, kind yeah. of it. And then see you later. So I've been doing a lot of research and stuff. And uh, yeah, that's what I'm on with at the minute. I'm actually looking into the uh, hyperbaric oxygen chambers. Yeah, I think I remember seeing some, uh, seeing you put some of that on. Yeah, Facebook yeah, yeah. Like so I've, have you I've, found one yet? Well, th- there is some, uh, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of, a couple of clinics in Yorkshire, I think there's two, and they, they use them for uh, people with multiple sclerosis. Yeah. Um, and they're, apparently they're really good, you know, they're really good at helping that. Um, but I haven't found anywhere I can just visit and pay, right. and you know, maybe there is some out there, but, you know, from what I can see, like I need, the research I've done, I'd like to go in one every day. Right, okay. Um, but... You know, obviously, it needs to be within the local area. Course, like, I need—I'm yeah, yeah. at the gym every day. It needs to tie in. So, what I'm looking at now is actually leasing one. So I was going to say, how much would it cost? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I found a company, and they're—they're they're happy to lease one to me. Uh, so, I could have it in the gym. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Possibly some of the other fighters could use it, but we could go in there. And uh, there's a guy called Joe Namath. He was a NFL player, um, and he—he he had you know a lot of concussions. Obviously, in NFL, you're getting hit from like multiple angles. Yeah. So they did a they did a special kind of scan on his brain uh, called a SPECT scan. So it's like um, it's like nuclear medicine. So they inject like protons into you, right. and then they can see like blood blood and oxygen flow. Um, so I think they use it for epilepsy and, yeah. and some other conditions as well. So they did this scan on him, and they can see they've got these big dark patches in his brain. You know where you know blood and oxygen aren't getting to yeah. those those places, which is you know, coming from those concussions, from those hits, multiple sides. I think, I think, the, I know nothing about fucking American football. <laughs> I know nothing about football, but um, from from what they could say on the scans, his his position that he played, yeah. he always got hit from like one side, like yeah. a certain side he was getting hit from. So, yeah, if he was playing like right back, he always got hit from left hand side. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. So, so uh, it was that side that was really damaged, yeah. you know. So it's obviously from those collisions. So um, he, he did these, he did these tests. Um, he, so he had this scan, and then he did um, one hour a day for forty days in a hyperbaric oxygen chamber. Um, after forty days, they retested him. They did, they did another scan, and there was improvement. Yeah. So th- they said, right, we'll keep going. So they did it again, and they ended up doing. Uh, 120 days, so they did, they did like three, three sets. Lots, yeah, yeah. yeah, but it was continuous. So yeah. 120 days, one hour a day inside this oxygen chamber. And uh, yeah, when, when they scanned his brain at the end, it, it, you know, it's like 90% or more. It's his brain's working all, you know, all the areas that were dark and now fully oxygenated, right, blood's yeah, moving yeah. to him. And, uh, you know, if, if you look at him now and, you know, you hear him speaking and stuff, like those kind of injuries would be, you know, someone would be slurring and yeah. stuff. But he speaks perfectly. Is a yeah, he's a smart guy, and, and he uh, he says he feels great. And he's been tested since then as well, and there's, and there's been no deterioration yeah. or anything like that. So yeah, so that kind of uh, so that's on the cards. Then is that something you're going to look yeah, at? Yeah, one hundred percent, one hundred percent. That that's something I'll re- I really want to look into. Um, I think that I think that that could be that could be the thing that. Uh, so it helps me. So, so I just need one of these scans first. That's what I'm trying to find at the minute. Right. Yeah. Um, so you've got like a starting point. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's it. I need. I need a starting point. So if I can get one of these scans, I'm gonna try and replicate what the, this Joe Namath did. Um, yeah, and, and and see if I can uh, replicate the results as well, yeah, and, and see how I feel. Yeah. And if I can log this down, even if it don't work, at least it's gonna help other people. Yeah. Yeah. You know. I've got to, I've got to try it so uh, Gosh, yeah, yeah. yeah so so that's what I'm that's what I'm thinking about right now is doing that and then uh, yeah like I say some of my fighters if it benefits me it could benefit them and I know when I actually inquired about it they said oh you know what why would you want a want a chamber and I told them the reason and they were like oh you know a lot of sports people boxers and stuff are using them and I and I, I wasn't really aware of that you know 
I've researched it and, and found stuff out, but apparently, it, you know, a lot of athletes are using them. Is that the one? It, so it's the one where it raises the or the. So it's the, it's the pressure of the oxygen. Yeah. So you you got like pure oxygen in a, in a chamber, yeah. and it's the the pressure. So it's what a, a diver would use if he had the bends. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it's a, it's about um, um, uh, like the. They measure it in atmospheres, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. And and the so it's the pressure of the oxygen that's getting pumped in. Um yeah, that's all that's what it is really. So it's nothing it's nothing crazy, yeah, you know. Yeah. It's just it sounds quite simple, really. You're just yeah. breathing in pressurized oxygen. If it does the job and you can't complain, can you? Yeah, so so I've still you know, I'm still learning about it. Yeah. Um but yeah, for me it sounds like it's a it's a it could be a legitimate way to kind of fix my memory and stuff does feel like it's improving. Yeah. Um, and the doctor said, you know, a typical brain injury takes two years, but it's yeah. been, and it's been like two years now yeah, yeah. since I've really sparred. It's, it's been two years since the accident. So, yeah, who knows? So there's no, you, you ain't got any plans of fighting again then? I know I've seen you joking on your uh, Instagram. Saying yeah, yeah, I keep look, joking. People, people, people keep asking me. You know, th there's things... That, there's things that I never ticked off my list. You know, I wanted to fight in Japan right. on the big rising show, you know, what used to be pride now rising, you know, I'd love to fight on that. Yeah. Um, I'd love to fight in Las Vegas. Um, yeah, there's a lot, a lot of, there's a few things that I'd like to do. Yeah. That I just never ticked off that list. And, uh, yeah, it'd be hard to turn something down like that. But to never say never then, I mean... Just, yeah, 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 never say never. I, I ain't going to be fighting within the next six months. Yeah. I know that for a fact, yeah. You know, I want to do this oxygen stuff first, and, yeah. but but I am I have started... I've not been training. I've You know, I've got a back injury. Right. I was in a car accident, and then I've got like a, a tear on one of my discs. I've got a ruptured disc. I've got bulging discs. Fucking You know, hell. yeah, so... I'm really, really struggle, you know, with grappling and stuff with my back. I did a yeah. little bit of boxing yesterday. Now my back's fucking killing today. Yeah, yeah. Um, so for me now, it's about just training and getting healthy. Like if, yeah. I, if I can get strong and get my weight down, I'm 103 kilos now. Yeah. Fighting at 77 kilos, that's a massive difference on my body. So if I can get my weight down, yeah. that's probably going to make me feel a bit better. And then try and eat a bit healthier. That's obviously better for my brain yeah, as well. Yeah. And uh, yeah, just just try and live a bit of a better lifestyle than I have been. And obviously continuing with your coaching. Yeah, just co coaching and stuff, yeah. So looking at the prospects that you've got in the gym then, um, obviously Louis pro now. I, I, uh, I, was, I saw a lot of his fights across the AVT um, page and he's just fought in Dubai recently. Uh, so, so that was Bahrain. So Louis oh, actually, Bahrain, sorry, yeah. Louis actually still amateur. He's going to stay amateur. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. I thought he'd gone pro. I thought no, he'd... no. So he's going to, it was going to turn pro. He's going to stay amateur. He's going to do the Euro, IMF European Championships, which is in June yep. in Belfast. Uh, and then, you know, look at turning pro after that. Yeah. So, uh, but yeah, there's so many guys in the gym some killers in there that it's hard to like say oh you know this guy's good this guy's good you know what i tend to find is it's the guys who i kind of forget are there yeah so i've got guys that they just turn up every day in the training and i'm like yeah yeah he's doing his stuff that's cool and then you know after like a couple of years i look and i think oh fuck that guy's really good yeah, like, yeah. Why, why i noticed him before you know you know not that i've not noticed him but yeah. it's like they're the not when you say Oh, who's the, who's like up and coming guys? I don't think of them straight away. You think of the guys who are like who are who are up. It's the guys who are like Louis. Yeah. I, you know, you turn on Facebook or Instagram. Louis hitting pads. Louis got a fight coming up. It's like, oh yeah, this guy, this guy. Everyone's talking about him. But there's people in the gym who you'd never hear of. Yeah. Who are just working away, and you know they're just grinding every day, coming in the gym, and uh, yeah, there's there's some fucking base. It's uh yeah, it's a scary time it's, it's to be fun, an MMA I mean, fighter, really. Walking walking in AVT and just seeing the people around. I mean, like I, I would I put on my Instagram uh, a couple of weeks ago. It was funny. They're like Mark Casey's over at corner scrapping away. There's Tom holding pads for uh, Danny T. You know the DJs. Like, yeah. All sorts going on. There's yeah, all these people. Yeah. I think Rico might have been there. And it was like all these. It's just you just want to assume that's very unassuming. You know, you walk in yeah. and just doing the thing, but they're all high profile individuals just trying to yeah, crack it's, on. It's crazy. I mean, obviously I started coaching from a young age. I mean, I opened my first MMA gym, if you like, when I was like 19 in Doncaster and, uh, 
Yeah, I've always had like a passion for coaching, and I think now it's kind of come with this gym. It's all come come together. We've got like the big cage. We've got a massive mat. We've got all the strength and conditioning stuff. Yeah, and now all these we've got all these fighters coming in from different, you know, different areas and stuff are joining us. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. This is this is the dream really. This is what I've always wanted, yeah. and it's, it's and you've obviously got two gyms now. You've got one in Scunthorpe. Yeah, I've got as well. there's one in Scunthorpe as well. So that that's pretty new. Yeah. Um, you know, it only opened in September. So, you know, but there's, you know, there's plenty of members there and obviously a lot of those guys are just new, new starters or whatever. So it's a lot of novices. Yeah. Obviously Rico helps out over there and, um, but yeah, so that that's kind of built, that's kind of building. That's like an earlier AVT, yeah. you know, to where we are now in Leeds. We've got all these pro fighters. We've got all these coaches working and stuff. Because um, have you got any more seminars coming up? Because I know obviously you had Frank Mir in uh, last year. You, you yeah. had the Polaris champion. Uh, what was what's his name? Yeah, Munch. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We had him down. He's uh, a cool guy. Who else have you got coming um, on? Have you got any so, lined up or? Yeah. So so we've got um, we've got Chris Houter. So he's actually the head of Combat Base. Right, so yeah. when I, when I when I'm talking when I was a, was a 18, 19, and I was going to Pontefract and training. Yeah. They're like, oh, you know, we've got this seminar. Our head coach is coming over from America. So he's a black belt. So he comes and it's, it's Chris Houter. And he ended up giving me my blue belt. So, and then I've stayed under the same association. So I managed to get all the way to black belt on, right. underneath uh, Houter's association. So, yeah, so he, he, he's not been to the UK for a long time. Um, but he's, he's going to come in February. February. So February 17th. That's at my gym. Yeah. So, uh yeah, so for all the jujitsu geeks, that's that'll be a real good, uh, yeah, yeah. good seminar. And then, yeah, I've got there's talks of Eddie Bravo coming over again. I spoke to him last year, and he's like, "Oh yeah, 2019, I'll be back in the UK." Right. I know he's doing a camp in Amsterdam in April. Uh, I'm not sure if he could um, jump over and, and come to the UK. Maybe I, I'll speak to him. I don't know. I know last time is like visa issues. You had to do loads of stuff with the visas yeah. and stuff because uh, it's of, a work is working. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Like come over to do, like a lot of people travel and do seminars and stuff, but obviously Eddie Bravo is a high profile. All you got to do is look on Facebook and you can see oh he's doing a seminar. Yeah. So yeah, it, um, I know he's had problems before, but yeah, he's uh, yeah he's talked about a funny story where he got like a, he got like arrested. I think. <laughs> At the, air, at the airport, yeah, I think he came in to do seminars. This is right. a long time yeah, ago, yeah, yeah. yeah. And he didn't, he didn't have the correct visa or whatever, so they ended up uh, sticking in him a room and like interrogating. It's him a and conspiracy, shit. that's yeah, what it is. Yeah. <laughs> Sent him off, but um, we managed to get all that sorted, and uh, yeah, I so I had him over a couple of years ago. Yeah, so hopefully get him back uh, this year, and then uh, yeah, we've we've always got seminars going yeah. off and. Uh, yeah, it's uh, it was cool. It was cool meeting Frank Mir. Obviously, like he's a legend at the sport. Yeah, he's a coming, funny guy. Like coming down that day and seeing him there. Like again, it, I suppose you used to seeing these people on TV and you know, yeah. then to see him in real life, he, he was just there in his Nike tracksuit, just cracking on. Yeah, it that's was, it. It was class, you know, it was unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. He, he always says he's like, oh, I'm just a normal guy, and but yeah, obviously people. He's a normal he, guy. Yeah, he's, he's not. He's, he's not a, a normal. He guy. is a gorilla, that man. <laughs> like, but also next to him, I'm like. Yeah, this is just like we're the same species, but that's about as good yeah. as you're gonna get. This guy's like a different Yeah. yeah. Um so what's next for you then? Obviously, um we're not fighting at the minute. You're coaching, sort of from like a personal branding and building up your profile. I know you've like hinted at podcasting yourself. Is yeah, that something yeah. you wanna go down? Yeah, hundred percent. I mean I love stuff like this and and I've got so many I've got so much like information to share, you know. Um and, and I know so many great people as well. There's so many coaches who've like helped me. I've never really had like a, a coach, like this one guy who's trained me. I've always yep. just sort of like done my own thing. And I've, by doing that, I've met a lot of different people. And uh, yeah, I'd, I'd really like to get some of those people in and uh, yeah. and speak to them and pick their brains. And like like I say, there's so much good information out there. And I've, I've, this is a great way to uh, to delve into it, I think. Definitely. I mean, this this style of content, like this is why I started the podcast. It's just, it's good to sit down and speak to the different people, you know, like this podcast that we're doing, I want to speak to like influential people from all walks of life, you know, and I'm in, I enjoy business and I'm obviously trying to run my own business at the same yeah. time. So like just, I enjoy it. And obviously the people that are already following you, they're definitely going to want to speak to yeah. all, all the people that you actually know. Like just then off, I speak to Eddie Bravo, he's going to come back down again. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's mental, you know. So if uh, we'll, we'll wrap the podcast up there. If people want to follow you, where, yes. where's the best place to follow you? Um, so you can follow me on Facebook. Just search for Danny Mitchell MMA. Uh, so I've got a page there that I'll put regular updates on. And on Instagram, same again, Danny Mitchell MMA. 
Uh, find me on there. I have got a Twitter account, but I never use it. I never, I never go on Twitter. Yeah. I just can't be asked. Twitter's dead. Yeah, Twitter's yeah. gone. It's all about the gram. It definitely is. <laughs> and and the uh, uh, seminars, what date? February? Uh, Feb- February 17th. 17th. That's Chris Houter, uh, Jiu Jitsu seminar at my gym. And then I, I should be doing some seminars. Me and Liam Harrison are talking about doing some sort of right, MMA yeah. seminars where he teaches some strike and yep. I teach some grappling and we kind of work together. Um, so yeah, lot, lots in the pipeline, really. And, and keep your eyes peeled for his uh, upcoming podcast that you'll be starting as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah, definitely. definitely. Yeah, thank you very much for uh, for coming on the on the show. It's been an absolute pleasure. Yeah, it's been great. Thank you, mate. Cheers. Cheers.